So, um, I wanted to go through comparing, well, really, I'm not going to compare these classical mechanics and classical field theory. The main thing you should know is that basically if you can do, if you have done problems in the Lagrangian theory of classical mechanics, there are equations that are entirely analogous to that when working in classical field theory. And all I wanted to show was working through a few examples of that because there are some places where you can mess up. So here I've just come the main comparisons between the two. Instead of uh, coordinates, we're working with fields. Instead of a Lagrangian that depends on the coordinates and its time derivatives, we have a Lagrangian that is an integral over a Lagrangian density. And normally we just call this the, the Lagrangian density, the Lagrangian. Um, because that is what enters in the Euler-Lagrange Euler equations. So, you know, you really just care about this. Uh, if you want more details, you know, David Dong's lecture notes or any other source, you know, is a better place to uh, learn about that. But I just want to care, I just want, I just care about... Uh, doing some examples. So here we've got the Euler-Lagrange equations for a field, for a classical field. And I have this A label here, that just means the Lagrangian could depend on more than one field. So there's a field equation for each field labeled by A. Um, and this looks kind of confusing the first time you see it, but it's it's not any more difficult to use than well, actually it is it is a little bit more difficult to use honestly, but it's conceptually the same as the old equation. So um, you know you can do it; it's doable. It's fine. So let's just do an example to show that. So I have this Lagrangian here which is really uh, analogous to this Lagrangian for the harmonic oscillator, and you see it in classical mechanics. And I just wrote this here to say that, you know, this you probably wouldn't have any trouble solving using the Euler-Lagrange equations. So we shouldn't expect too much trouble from this. And, you know, relatively speaking, compared to, you know, the later stuff, yeah, it's, it's not so bad, but there are some pitfalls here. And already, actually, looking at these two things, so here's our Lagrangian, here's what we need to do to it to find the equations of motion. And naively, you would, well, here, I'll just, I'll just show you. So this term, this is actually not at all any more difficult than what you would do in classical mechanics. The derivative of this with respect to the field is you can easily see that it's this, negative m squared. Oh, that is, that should not be there. That should be just i. Okay. Okay. It's that. So, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's easy. That actually is easy. But the issue is with this this term here. So, and the issue is that in our equations, we, we're using mu as a summing index. And in our Lagrangian, we've used mu as a summing index. So you might write, you know, first, well, let's just worry about calculating this, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the mu's derivative of the field. Um, if you wrote down if you, uh, the derivative here, this kind of thing, uh, oops, 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 and you tried working with this, you would end up very confused because uh, you have three mu's here, and that's 
that's that's not good. That's just the same issues you always have when you're doing uh, an index notation. You don't want to reuse indices. So obviously this is a summing index. It doesn't matter what we use. So instead of calculating the derivative with respect to the nth derivative of the field, we'll do it with, say, the sigma, sigmith, sigmith, derivative, derivative field. Ugh, this thing. Okay. So, yeah, the only term that depends on derivatives is this first term. So, uh, I've just, the derivative of the Lagrangian is just becomes the derivative of this. And so how do we how do we actually do this? So we will do the product rule just like normal. We'll bring the one half out. And we'll have the first term times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And this prime here just means derivative with respect to d sigma phi. And so we have to calculate these two things. So uh, the first one, the easy one, you can uh, I've written here. So the derivative of the muth derivative of phi with respect to the derivative of the, the sigma th derivative of phi. So basically, if mu equals sigma, then this is just the derivative of a thing with respect to itself. So you get one. And the derivatives of the fields that are different are independent, so you get zero. And that's just encapsulated in this chronic delta. So the fact that you, that you get a sigma up top is maybe a little confusing, but um, it has to be there, <laughs> basically. Um, and mu has to be on the bottom because we started with, we're doing this term, we have a mu at the bottom, so mu has to stay at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's very natural that this appears up top. And I guess when you do, when you take the derivative of something with respect to a lower index, it becomes an upper index. That seems to be what's happening. I'm not a total expert on this, but anyway, it'll work out. So uh, the other thing we have to do is this derivative, which is complicated by the fact that it's upper. This is d mu with mu as uh, you know the contravariant index. And to deal with that, all we have to do is write this uh, using the Minkowski metric. So if we use this on this uh, thing, it will raise it. Well, the point is this, this is equal to this. Hopefully you know at least that much. And now this, uh, this is a constant matrix. It doesn't depend on the field or space or anything. It's just, you know, diagonals are one, negative one, negative one, negative one. So I can just pull that out. And then I'll just have uh, a very, something very similar to what I had here, only instead of mu, I'll have a gamma. So, uh, so I'll have another delta function, but instead of mu, I'll have gamma here. And I've, you can see I've pulled this out. So hopefully it's believable that this is equal to this. So now that we've calculated those, we can plug those in here. Um, yeah, so this goes here. And that goes there. Um, and this is very easy to calculate, to, to work with. This will raise this index. So it'll be d sigma or sorry, d gamma phi, and then this delta function will change that gamma to a sigma, so this becomes d sigma phi. And we get the same thing here, this 
nu just will become a sigma because of the Kronecker delta. And so I just have two of these that I add together and the one half. So I just get this, d sigma phi. So we can go back and it's just right here. D rid of the Lagrangian with respect to the sigmas sigmas derivative of phi is just d sigma phi. And so since we use sigma here uh, to compute this whole term, we need to use, you know, we sum here. So this should be d sigma of this. So um, yeah, d, d sigma of that is just d sigma sigma phi. <clears throat> okay. So, oh, you know what? Uh, wow. Zero. Okay. Uh, so now we can just write down our equation. So, and it will just be this thing. Mm. Uh, minus this thing, and it has a minus sign, and plus equals zero. And this is the Klein Gordon equation. Uh, that's not so important right now. Really, the, the only point of this was just we have some Lagrangian. And let's apply the Euler Lagrange equations and get the equations of motion. That's that's the only point so far. <clears throat>